Let's meet the granddaughter of President Herbert Hoover and CNN commentator Margaret Hoover next on Behind the Headlines. This is Behind the Headlines with behind the scenes analysis on issues affecting Pennsylvanians. Sponsored by the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy. Now, here's your host. Hi, welcome to a new edition of Behind the Headlines. I'm Charlie Greenwald, Senior Fellow for the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy. We're on location today at the Radisson Hotel uh, in Harrisburg, where uh, the Pennsylvania Business Council is having a special banquet, and their featured speaker is Margaret Hoover. Uh, Margaret is the great-granddaughter of President Herbert Hoover. Uh, she is the, uh, one of the political uh, commentators for CNN. Uh, she had been a political commentator with Fox for a while. Uh, she has worked for some of the greatest political figures of our time, President George W. Bush and for Mayor Rudy Giuliani. She's also the author of a, of a relatively new book called American uh, Individualism, How a New Generation of Conservatives Can Save the Republican Party. Welcome to the program, Margaret. Thank you very much it's, for having it's me. It's so nice I to appreciate have you. It. Um, welcome back to Pennsylvania. You're a Bryn Mawr graduate. I and I was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania at Women McGee's Hospital. So I have ah. a little bit of East and a little bit of West in me. Okay. What is your message for Pennsylvanians today? Well, I am here to talk about how the millennial generation, which is the generation of Americans that were born really at the beginning of the Reagan era to the end of the Clinton presidency. So 1980 to 1999. They are the largest generation in American history. And I'm here to talk about who they are, what makes them tick, and why the Republican Party can't afford to ignore them anymore. And I actually think that in the roots of the millennial generation, we could have the modernization of the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. What do you think needs to happen for that to move ahead? Well, the first thing we got to do, and one of the things my book was about, was sort of a wake-up call to the Republican Party on who the millennials were and how to connect to them. We missed the boat a little bit in 2012 with the millennial generation, but, but we're, we're two-thirds through the millennial generation in terms of their aging up to voting. So in the next two presidential cycles, we'll have a bite at the apple with the last third of that generation. Now, there are 80 to 90 million of them. Estimates range between 80 to 90 million. That means 27 million more millennials than baby boomers, 17 million more millennials than Generation X. They are the largest generation in American history, and, and they're, they're making their mark in many, many ways. So I'm going to talk about how they're making their mark in politics, but I'm also going to talk about how they're making their mark in terms of businesses. There's an influx of them into our corporations and into our small businesses and into our nonprofits, and they have very different sensibilities in the workplace than previous generations. So the key is, how do you harness their energy? What makes them tick? How do you leverage that for your own company's bottom line? And you're a gay rights activist as well, and uh, you have uh, sort of uh, been working with different Republican leaders to take a different approach or a different um, attack to try to appeal to the gay community, what would that be? Well, this is an issue uh, that is very consistent with the history of the Republican Party and the history of the party that is in favor of individual freedom. Mm -hmm. And it's frankly very consistent with the ideals of my great-grandfather, Herbert Hoover, who wrote the first book, American Individualism, whose title I borrowed from my book. And look, to appeal to the millennial generation, if we really are the party of individual freedom, uh, it's very hard for millennials to understand. This is a generation where 70% of them are in favor of same-sex marriage. It is very hard for them to understand why their gay friends and gay neighbors and gay teachers and gay relatives can't have all the same uh, advantages under the law as their straight friends and neighbors and teachers and relatives. And it, it, to me, it seems like this is very consistent with the history of the party of individual freedom to champion uh, these, so, these sorts of rights. Let's talk about the legacy of your great-grandfather for a moment. He was certainly the greatest Secretary of Commerce we've ever had, and he's one of the great humanitarians and one of the great organizers and management uh, minds of the 20th century. You find that he saved millions of lives in Belgium during the First World War. He saved millions of lives in Russia after the First World War, and then he organizes the flood relief in the along the Mississippi during the 1920s. 
uh, what he did was phenomenal, and he got lots of uh, attention for it. What would he think if he saw the economy today? What would his analysis of the economy today be, and what would his uh, diagnosis be to uh, improve it? Well, you know, it, that's that's a tough one. First of all, I really appreciate how much you know about Herbert Hoover, because so few Americans understand uh, what an extraordinary legacy he had up until he was president. Most people, if they were taught what I was taught in school, only know about the Herbert Hoover of the Hoovervilles in the Great Depression, and they don't realize it. As you mentioned, he saved one-third of Europe's population in World War I through humanitarian relief that, by the way, was mostly non-governmentally organized and mostly paid through voluntary donations. So uh, an extraordinary legacy, I appreciate you speaking to that. Here's the thing about economics, is that modern macroeconomics we've really learned as a result of studying the era in which Hoover was president. And when you look back at Hoover's presidency and how he handled the Great Depression, there were, there were some mistakes that were made, and there are things that we've learned because of those mistakes that I think Modern, or modern macroeconomics in the 1920s and early 1930s simply wasn't equipped to handle. We simply didn't know how to handle deflation. We didn't even recognize that there was deflation. We, uh, you know, Hoover tried, didn't believe in using the federal government to strong arm certain policies through. So he tried to get corporations to voluntarily keep wages at a certain rate. At a certain rate. Well, trying to get corporations to hold wages at a certain level turns out probably isn't the best economic policy. You know, what I would say in his defense is at least he was working through a voluntary system of getting corporations to work together rather than having the government mandate wages. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think his approach was very uh, conservative in the sense that he, he, he believed in marshalling the forces of the private sector to work together with the government rather than sort of a top-down approach of the federal government, which is, frankly, when you look at what FDR's policies were in the presiding the following 12 to 16 years, FDR didn't know what he was doing either. He, he gets a lot of credit for getting us out of the Depression because of the New Deal. But in hindsight, it turns out the New Deal didn't get us out of the Great Depression. Well, this is interesting because, of course, Amity Shale's book, The Forgotten Man, where this, this is a well. sort of a reinterpretation of the New Deal. It's probably true that we realize now the New Deal probably extended the Great Depression by maybe four years. Well, what we know is in 1936, 1937, the economy bottoms out again. And we actually have an even more severe depression than we had in 1931 and 1932 under Herbert Hoover. So uh, th there is, uh, Amity does a great job of debunking the mythology of the New Deal and reminding Americans that it was really World War II that helped get us out of the Great Depression. But I think a lot more work has to be done in terms of what Hoover did in his four years because, uh, you know, too much is given, blame is given to Smoot-Hawley which was, of course, the, the tax on international trade and the, the clamping down on international trade, which really affected less than 4% of the economy at the time. So Milton Friedman actually makes a pretty good case that that's not the nail in the coffin for the Great Depression. Um, so a, a lot of unpacking of those four years has to be done, but also in the context of Ho Herbert Hoover's entire life. He lived 90 years. For example, he wrote, he wrote seven books between the time, published seven books between the time he was 85 and 90. And we have just found two completed manuscripts that he never even published, which we published one last year, and we're publishing one this year. So he's an extraordinarily prolific writer, in addition to being a statesman, in addition to being a world-renowned mining engineer, in addition to being a humanitarian. So there's, there's, as you can tell, when you get me going on <laughs> Herbert Hoover's legacy, it's hard to get me to stop. 30 seconds. Uh, what's the legacy of your old boss, uh, President George W. Bush? Wow, you know, I was just down at the library in Texas when That's they opened it all up. Oh, fantastic! And uh, it was extraordinary. And I think all event. of the uh, the statesmen really spoke to, to two of his greatest contributions were his legacy in Africa, and I think, in my view, especially because 9/11 was so formative for me, uh, I think the way he responded on the day of 9/11 and and his his response to is Islamic Jihad. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think the the way he handled uh, the imminent war on terror, and uh, and frankly, his international uh, freedom agenda. 15 seconds. Why isn't Rudy Giuliani president? Rudy Giuliani was a great mayor of New York, and he is a great man, and he was a great leader of the country in the wake of 9-11. And I think um, yeah, that is a longer answer than 15 <laughs> we seconds. We have to have you we'll back for that. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Well, thank you so much for being with us today, Thanks Margaret. for having me. I we appreciate really it. really appreciate it. We'll be back with another segment of Behind the Headlines right after this. Behind the Headlines is a production of the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy, a nonpartisan, nonprofit research organization helping Pennsylvania build a brighter future.
Welcome back to Behind the Headlines. I'll be joined in the next segment by co-host Mara Donnelly. In this segment, however, uh, I will be uh, talking with David Taylor. Uh, Dave, welcome back to the show. Thanks very much, Charlie. Always a pleasure to be here. Well, of course, you are the executive director of the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association, and uh, there's no one, I think, in the Commonwealth better to talk to about workforce development and workforce readiness. This is something that has been on the mind of the governor since he came into office, something that he is trying to pursue to make Pennsylvania more competitive in the national and the international marketplace. And uh, recently, um, he, um, uh, he spoke uh, something that many businessmen have been saying for a long time. He pointed out that uh, Pennsylvania businesses, in many instances, are hard-pressed to hire new employees because of drug habits among applicants. And uh, he was immediately assailed. Yeah. Do you want to talk well, about this Absolutely, situation? yes. I mean, what, what the governor said is 100% correct. And I am sort of shocked and uh, and and angry that uh, that so much criticism would be directed towards uh, Tom Corbett when he is telling us the truth, uh, something that uh, business leaders across the Commonwealth already know, and something that the public uh, deserves to uh, to understand and to and to focus on. And let me just say, by by means of background, I had the honor of serving on the governor's manufacturing advisory council, and of all the issues facing the manufacturing sector that the workforce readiness uh, issue rose to, to, to being number one of the concerns of everything else um, facing our manufacturing employers. And there, there's a spectrum of challenges to, to hiring the workforce that we need. Certainly there's a, a, a lack of advanced skills um, you know, the science, technology, engineering, mathematic uh, uh, skills that are, are required in, in advanced manufacturing, but, but there's a broader challenge that I think should concern all of us, which is that manufacturers have to go through hundreds and hundreds of applicants to find even a handful of qualified new hires, people who can um, read, write, follow instruction, uh, 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 do basic math, uh, have the internal discipline to show up on time, and yes, to pass the drug test. And so uh, this is a problem that we cannot wish away. And uh, again, of all the impediments to employment, that uh, the drug use is one of the most preventable or correctable uh, uh, barriers to be overcome. So I just, you know, I come at this uh, saying, look, what do we as Pennsylvanians, what do we all agree on? Number one, that people who are unemployed should have the opportunity to return to the dignity of work to take care of themselves and their families. We should all want that. That should be a consensus point. Consensus point number one. Consensus point number two, between all of us, Democrats, Republicans, business and labor, the only acceptable number for workplace injuries is zero. And when you think about especially a manufacturing environment, where you have uh, heavy equipment, bladed instruments, extreme temperatures, chemical reactions. Um, there is a lot of very consequential stuff that's happening on that factory floor. And this is why our manufacturing employers have to have a drug-free workplace. We have to be in compliance with, with the law in terms of our uh, uh, regulatory obligations, our uh, uh, licenses, and our insurances. And again, I always thought that workers' comp uh, that the workers' compensation system was a consensus point that everyone agreed on. And yet the, the amount of, of scorn and ridicule being directed at the governor, uh, for me that just feels like, well, okay, then those critics don't care about workplace injuries and fatalities. It's shocking and it's shameful. And uh, this is something where, uh, you know, it, with, with the attention that's been focused on the governor's remarks, I really hope that this is a... Uh, sort of a teachable moment so that the public comes to understand that uh, that this is a major challenge for employers and beyond that for people who are who are out of work looking for work that um, you know that this is not about you know the boss being approved or saying that people shouldn't have fun on the weekends it's saying if you can't pass the drug test we cannot have you on our factory floor. What percentage of Pennsylvania manufacturers uh, administer a drug test for a job applicants would you estimate, David? Well, it's, it's many. Um, it, it, it's many, if not most. Um, I, I don't have that specific uh, uh, number. But again, if you have any sort of industrial environment where you have heavy equipment, bladed instruments, chemical reactions, extreme temperatures, 
in any of those places to be in compliance with the law, you have to have a sober workforce. There's no compromising on that. And I, I, again, I would hope that that would be a consensus point for Democrats, Republicans, business, and labor that our employees deserve a safe workplace and that the only acceptable number of workplace injuries is zero. How do we as a total society then deal with this uh, nationwide push that's being um, uh, promoted by some uh, who would like to see the legalization, for example, of marijuana. Uh, you have well, yeah, this, of uh, course, it, in Washington <laughs> and Colorado. Yes. And we have some legislators yes. in the Pennsylvania General yeah, State, Assembly. State Senator Dalen Leach from Montgomery County. That, and, that are promoting and this. And again, it's not, it's not wrong because it's illegal. It's illegal because it's wrong. And even if you decriminalize um, whichever narcotics, uh, it will not change the fact that, as I said, responsible employers who are complying with the law cannot hire people who, who test positive for drug use. And so, uh, you know, again, I think that, that, that many people, I don't think that many people really understand the implications of their actions, and we need to make it, make it known that by choosing to be a recreational drug user, you are rendering yourself unemployable in the manufacturing sector, which, which again, manufacturing jobs pay uh, more than 25% above uh, non-manufacturing jobs, that these are good family sustaining jobs with, with, with high wages and, and good benefits. And for people who are out of work, we should want those people to be, to be able to achieve those kinds of positions. There are thousands of manufacturing jobs in Pennsylvania that, that, that go wanting because our members, manufacturing employers, cannot find people who qualify. And yes, the skills gap is a big part of that, but the, the other issues that I mentioned, uh, you know, reading comprehension, basic math, following instructions, being, being able to, to show up to work on time, and being able to pass the drug test. Those are very real challenges. Will the uh, state press, you think, um, uh, take a harder look at this situation uh, to try to move it outside of the political arena, well, outside hope of so. being used I hope for so. political purposes, I hope so. and try to look at the the real um, the real um, pros and cons of for manufacturing in Pennsylvania in regard to this situation. Well, I hope so, and I and I believe that after the initial burst of uh, the attempted gotcha uh, in the press, that I think that that as time goes on and 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 that people focus on this issue and really think seriously about uh, you know, the consequences of, of hiring people who cannot pass the drug test, uh, thinking about the consequences on the, on, on the factory floor, uh, that people come to recognize that, yeah, there are very good reasons why our manufacturing employers have to have a drug-free workplace. Okay. Thank you very much for being with us today, David. My great pleasure. appreciate pleasure. it so much. Thank you, Charlie. We'll be back with the next segment right after this. Behind the Headlines is brought to you as a public service by the Pennsylvania Business Council, envisioning a commonwealth in which residents enjoy a very high quality of life in sustainable communities. The council works aggressively to define key long-term policy strategies and solutions that make the commonwealth more competitive, creating and sustaining a better Pennsylvania. Additional underwriting provided by the Worrell Corporation Foundation, based in Carlisle, Pennsylvania by the Edward H. and Jeannie Arnold Foundation, and by the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania, helping hospitals to provide healing, health, and hope to communities across the state. And by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. Behind the Headlines is also supported as a public service by Daily Underwriters of America, a better way for truck insurance and by Penn Waste, your best local choice for your waste removal and recycling needs. Hi, welcome back to Behind the Headlines. In this particular segment, Moore and I are fortunate enough to have with us at budget time, Kevin Shivers. Kevin, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Hi, now, of course, Kevin, you are the Executive State Director for NFIB, the National Federation of Independent Businesses, and you are very well placed within the hierarchy uh, in Harrisburg, to have a good knowledge of um, business climate, of legislation that's coming down the pike, uh, and uh, of the past, Pennsylvania's past history with, uh, with business. Um, with the governor's new budget uh, that's uh, been unfurled, uh, what's, your, uh, what's your opinion? Is it going to help business, hurt business, uh, or not make much of a difference? Well, we, we think actually the governor's budget is going to enable small businesses to catch a case of spring fever. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, and, and I'm not talking about sneezing and runny eyes. I'm talking about an excitement for uh, employers and entrepreneurs to invest into businesses and to grow their companies. Uh, you know, in the past in Pennsylvania, uh, our state, when we entered in a recession, uh, you know, we were always the last to enter the recession. It was a deep recession, and we were always the last state to leave the recession. Uh, one of the things that we have found, if you take a look at states all around our borders and all around America, states are dealing with billions of dollars in new and higher taxes because they have billions of dollars in debt and deficits in their operating budgets. Uh, what Pennsylvania has done through the leadership of Governor Corbett, also with legislative leaders in the House and the Senate, is they've actually spent the last two years holding the line on spending so that they have, were in a position now to be able to talk about job creating tax cuts, tax cuts to help business startups, tax cuts to help struggling small businesses, tax cuts to uh, create an environment where businesses want to come to Pennsylvania. What we think is important about that is when the nation finally leaves recession, Pennsylvania is going to be positioned now to be one of the leaders uh, in the country for economic growth. Now, isn't that a change? Well, I think that's actually pretty remarkable. I mean, I think if you look around over the last couple of years in most of the states, almost every state has had tax increases. Sure. And the fact that we held the line and didn't go through what most of the other states did, I think you're right, positions us remarkably well for the future. Amazingly, we didn't have tax increases. It's, it's really great. And if you take a look at the, the changes that the governor is proposing, I mean, they really are structural uh, and they really will send a message to uh, businesses that are looking to to come here and entrepreneurs that are looking to invest. Uh, the governor is looking to simplify the tax code. Uh, his proposal looks to throw out hundreds of pages uh, in our tax code uh, to make our tax code uh, more concise, more clear, and that's going to be easier to comply with for small businesses and mid-sized companies. The governor also is proposing a startup deduction uh, similar to the federal government uh, where businesses can uh, get a credit of up to, a deduction of up to $5,000 on the cost of starting a business and we all know how hard and expensive it is mm -hmm. to start a, a company uh, and how costly it is uh, but it, there's even more the, the governor is proposing uh, to allow businesses uh, small businesses who grow their company and then sell it and take the profit and start a new company currently in Pennsylvania you actually get taxed so there's no incentive for you uh, to turn one company into another productive right. company uh, the governor proposes to eliminate that tax penalty also, for many of my members who uh, struggle with making payroll or you have an emergency uh, repair that you need to make on a piece of machinery, um, every time an employer makes a loan to his company, it's subject to tax in Pennsylvania. We're one of the handful of states that actually does that. Uh, under federal law, all employers are required to take a salary. So a business owner has to take a salary. Well, many of the small businesses that I represent don't even take that paycheck home. They actually turn that paycheck back into the company uh, to make payroll, to fix a piece of machinery, buy a new piece of equipment. That's subject to tax and that's wrong. The governor proposes to eliminate that. The governor also is proposing to roll back the corporate net income tax mm -hmm. uh, and also to allow businesses to carry forward losses. So if you take a look in total at the overall changes that he is proposing to make, uh, it is going to uh, set Pennsylvania on a path uh, that uh, we're going to see growth, uh, we're going to see job creation, we're going to see increased revenue, uh, and that's a great thing for Pennsylvania. What are the chances that the governor is going to uh, be able to uh, move the bill through the General Assembly, Kevin? I, I am extremely optimistic. Uh, you're hearing uh, good things out of the Senate and the House. Uh, and again, it's because of the stewardship of, of the governor, mm -hmm. uh, Senate leaders, and House leaders uh, have put us in a position where we can create this kind of change. Well, um, you're going to have a busy next a couple busy months here <laughs> coming out trying sure. to get this through. Uh, what sort of steps are you going to be taking to get the word out that this is going to be good for Pennsylvania? Well, uh, you know, a couple of uh, weeks ago, uh, Lieutenant Governor Cawley spoke with our members about the changes. Uh, you know, we've held seminars with our members. We've testified before the legislature uh, as well as other business groups, Secretary Revenue. I know the, the governor has put a full court press uh, and has, uh, has asked his cabinet to go out and explain and make the case for 
why these changes are important. Uh, and I, I think it sends a positive message. Uh, you know, I talked to one CEO who said, you know, uh, these changes uh, tell me that Pennsylvania is serious about creating a climate for job creators to grow and to thrive. Uh, that speaks volumes to me. A lot of these changes are phased in over a period of time. Uh, but the goal ultimately uh, is going to position Pennsylvania to be in the top 25 uh, states in the country by 2025, and we think that's a good thing. It would be really nice to get a lot of CEOs engaged in this issue. Wouldn't Absolutely. That, that, I mean, wouldn't legislators prefer to hear from, not that they don't love you, but <laughs> prefer to hear from CEOs about how this would how it would specifically impact their company you're absolutely right about that and i, I think it's important for your uh, viewers especially those that are entrepreneurs small business mm -hmm. owners ceos uh, to reach out to their local legislators and explain to them uh, that pennsylvania's tax code puts their businesses at a competitive disadvantage and how these types of changes are important going forward mm -hmm. and the governor even though i believe there were some i saw one or two um, newspaper editorials that were questioning um, this particular move. Um, since I've been involved with economic development in Virginia for so many years, um, I laud the governor's uh, trip to Brazil and to South America to try. Very brief trip, but yet a trip that I think is very important in visiting one of the world's up and coming economies mm -hmm. and trying to bring back business to, uh, to Pennsylvania. Um, what was, uh, were you involved with that at all, Kevin? Uh, no, I was not on that trip a couple weeks ago, but uh, the, uh, you know, we're, we're pleased the governor is looking at opening new markets uh, for Pennsylvania companies to sell their stuff. Uh, you know, that's what we do right, is, is we make great stuff. Our products, we think, are better than uh, uh, those manufactured anywhere else in the world. We have the best workers in Pennsylvania, uh, but we have to do our level best to open up new markets. Uh, so we applaud the governor uh, for, uh, you know, trying to reach out, uh, going down to South America, a huge trading partner uh, for Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and finding ways to open those markets. If we can create those kinds of trading opportunities, uh, that actually helps small business. Maybe a lot of our folks aren't actually uh, selling overseas, but they're supplying those companies that are making widgets that are then being sold overseas. Yeah. That's a good thing. Okay. We want to thank you for being with us. Can't uh, thank you enough for the, um, the uh, information that you bring to our viewers. We look forward to having you back in the near future. We'll be back again next week with a brand new edition of Behind the Headlines. Mar and I will see you then. Behind the Headlines is a production of the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy, a nonpartisan, nonprofit research organization helping Pennsylvania build a brighter future.